you guys ever seen the movie um, Usual Suspects? If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's a very good movie. It's a thriller. It's like a it's like a mystery thriller, and it's even really funny too. It's got it's like a all in one like an action mystery thriller comedy. It's even I got some drama in it too. But anyway, um, I was thinking about. <laughs> For those of you who have seen the movie, then you'll know what I'm talking about. For those of you who haven't, then I'm going to be ruining a portion of it. But I'm not ruining the big, like, it's got a surprise ending, so I'm not going to ruin that. But, um, in the movie, there is this main villain who's kind of a faceless guy. You never really get to see him. You just, you just picture him in your own mind for the longest time in the movie. And his name is Kaiser Soze. And they liken him to the devil. They, um, everybody in the movie basically talks about Kaiser Soze being like the mob boss of all mob bosses. Like, you know, Kaiser Soze in modern days would be the head of the Illuminati. He is like the Satan of Satans, right? untouchable nobody can even get close to him he's that underground it's almost like he's so underground that people don't even really know who he is but he's still giving orders um so they liken him to the devil and they say that the tricks that kaiser soze uses to to get people to do his bidding for him is really that he employs them without their knowledge. They think they're working for someone else, but they're actually working for Kaiser Soze, right? So some guy approaches you and says, I need you to deliver this truck full of stuff to a warehouse. Or I need you to go take an empty truck and pick up a bunch of stuff from a warehouse. And then drop the truck off at this address, you know. And if the truck driver says, I want to know who, who I'm working for, they say, you're not going to know who you're working for. It's better that way. So the truck driver does his deal and he gets his money and he had no idea that he was working for Kaiser Soze. They say that's his biggest trick is that nobody knows that they're actually working for him. Therefore... How can you rat out somebody who you don't you don't even know who he is? How do you rat him out? Right? You don't give a description of a guy you've never met or never heard his voice or anything, right? So that's that's his power. Is is that he people actually believe that he doesn't exist. You know, he's like a myth. But he is a real guy. But his legend has been built up so much. And people are afraid of him. He's, he, he's like the boogeyman. You know, like in the movie they say, you know, the gangsters would tell their sons, like, if you ever rat on your pop, Kaiser Soze will get you. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't take kindly to um, rats. We don't have any rats in this family. You know, but if we do have a rat, Kaiser Soze will get him. So, I just thought it was interesting. The, the power that you have when people do stuff for you and they don't even know they're doing it for you. I just find that interesting. And if the people who are working for you don't know it, and they're, they're in it for the money and they like the job and they're they think they're making good money, then those people are going to be motivated. In fact, those people might even feel like they're working for themselves, like they're just kind of doing what they want to do, when really they're carrying out Kaiser Soze's bidding for him. But it doesn't mean that it can't be enjoyable for the, for the person doing the deed, right? It's slavery in a sense because, you know, you're 
You're making people do your bidding for you. But in, a, in another sense, it's freedom because people want to do it. He's not forcing anybody to do it. He's saying, you know, he's sending his henchmen out and his henchmen are saying, hey, you want to you want to make some money? You want to make 5,000 bucks? Okay, here. 5,000 bucks in one night. You just, you know, pick this up and take it to this guy. You know? And you, you could be delivering gold. You could be delivering weapons. You could be li- delivering dead bodies. You know, you have no idea what's in the truck. Right? You don't care. And you're, and you're told not to care. What do you care? What do you care? You're making 5,000 bucks. If you don't do this, somebody else is going to do it. So you might as well do it if you want to make 5,000 bucks. Right? And that's the... That's why people do that kind of stuff, right? Because they say, well, it's just an opportunity. That's all it is. It's an opportunity for me to earn a living and a comfortable living at that, right? You make a couple drop-offs a month, you're making 10 grand. It's willful... Ignorance is what it is. You know, I think a lot of us, I think a lot of us do that, to be honest with you. Right? You work at your job. Your job is, uh, you know, you don't necessarily like your job, but you need the money. Um, maybe the policies of your company are hurting the customers, but... You say, well, that's not my fault, you know. That's the policy makers. I'm just carrying out the policy of the policy makers, you know. President of the company told me to do X, so I did it. And if I didn't do it, somebody else would step up and do it. So I might as well, since I have to make a living, I might as well do that thing. Interesting. You know, this might seem like it's a little bit off topic, but I'm going to bring it up. Um, a lot of things in the Bible are not literal. A lot of them. I would almost venture to say the vast majority of the Bible is not literal. I would, I would definitely, um, I would definitely say that. The vast majority of it is not literal. Um, Like you take the Mark of the Beast, for example. The classic uh, interpretation of the Mark of the Beast is a literal, literal mark, right? What happens in the end times, according to the book of Revelation, the, uh, the beast takes over the land. And he's the supreme leader. He's the Kim Jong Un of the of the earth. And he tells the people, like, look, here's 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 the deal. You're gonna get a you're gonna get a mark, like a tattoo, on your back of your hand or your forehead, or both. It's not very clear, but you're gonna get this mark. Or if you don't, you can't buy or sell. You can't take part in the economy. Can't can't do anything in the economy. Now follow me here. I'm trying to make a connection. What I said earlier. Just follow me. Mark of the Beast says that you can't participate. You you can't earn a living if you don't have the Mark of the Beast on your hand or your forehead. Well, when they talk about other things in the Bible, they make reference to the same type of um, imagery back in the Old Testament I believe it's in Leviticus Deuteronomy one of the first five books of the Bible they talk about the feast of unleavened bread and um, Moses is writing down what God's saying and God says to Moses he says the Feast of Unleavened Bread, let this serve 
as a mark on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the Lord delivered you out of Egypt. He delivered you from slavery out of Egypt. Brought you into the promised land. <laughs> Is that a coincidence, you think, that, um, that that would be a mark on your hand and your forehead? And then that exact imagery was repeated again in the Revelation? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think that is a accident or a coincidence. And most Bible scholars believe that what God was saying in Leviticus, the way that they wrote back then, the, the poetry that they used, the, the, the context of what they wrote was, they would say a mark on your hand which would indicate your deeds, the things that you would do, right? You do things with your hands. You work with your hands. You do a lot of things with your hands, right? You can hurt people with your hands. You can help people with your hands. And what about your forehead? That's your, that's your attitude, your mindset, your, um, your, your belief system. And this is after the Jews had been delivered from Egypt. So God said to Moses, like, let the Feast of Unleavened Bread serve as a, as, as a mark on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the Lord loves you and cares about you and delivered you from slavery in Egypt. So in other words, everything you do, everything you think about, that's what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is, is for. It's to remind you who you are. You're God's people. You behave in a certain way. There are certain things that you don't do. You're committed to helping others. You're committed to not um, being selfish or evil to others. You're committed to doing good deeds, right? And then we have this sort of antithesis of this in the book of Re Revelation, where it's not a mark of God on your hand or your forehead. It's the mark of the beast on your hand and your forehead. I find that interesting. Of all the places on your body, it could be on your foot, your knee, your stomach, your back, your elbow. But it's on the back of your hand, it's on your forehead. So do you think maybe it would make more sense that those whose deeds are evil and those whose mindsets are evil... Those are the ones with the true mark of the beast, not because you got a stupid tattoo on your on your hand or on your it's not a literal mark. Right? And think about what it says. You can't participate in this economy in the end times unless you have the mark of the beast. So what does that mean? Well, it basically means that if you don't if you don't do evil deeds, you ain't going to make no money, son. If you don't chisel off somebody else, then they're going to chisel off you, and you're going to end up broke. You're going to be at the bottom of the barrel. So the only way to get ahead in a dishonest world is to be more dishonest than everybody else, right? Some societies can be so corrupted that the only way that you can survive is by protecting yourself while hurting others at the same time. If everybody's turned against everybody else, the people who are selfless are going to get devoured in that situation. Just completely devoured. Because nobody wants to share. Everybody wants to take for themselves. It's a true Darwinian mindset. Look out for number one. Fuck everybody else. You don't have to have that attitude 
if everyone else has a good attitude. But if everyone else has that attitude, the only way you're going to survive is if you have that attitude too. So you can't participate in this culture that we're heading into or that we're actually could be in right now. Unless you're a dishonest person. Unless you're a criminal, thief. You know? To me, that makes much more sense. And much like Kaiser Soze, you know, I don't care what you call the devil. I don't care. I don't care if you think the devil is a real guy. I don't care if you think he's a, just a spiritual force. Or if the devil is symbolic just for our own selfish interests, which I tend to think that. I tend to think that evil spirits and the devil and hell and all that stuff is literally what we naturally tend toward. We tend to choose the what's in it for me kind of a path, right? Because what, what, what makes you happy? What do you want, right? What do you want? You want money, you want sex, you want stuff, you want power. That's what you want, right? You don't want to work, but you do to get the money. If you could retire at 35, then you would. Maybe you do something, but you only do what you, en you enjoy, right? If you got enough money, to retire, you're not going to go. You're not going to go deliver the mail. You're going to work some shitty job because you don't need to. You only do what you want. That's what everybody wants, right? We want financial freedom. We want power, sex. We want people to adore us, right? We want to have a bunch of toys, boats, and cars, and houses, and Stiff. I mean, when when you realize that that stuff is, no matter how plentiful it is, no matter how awesome it is, it's always short-lived, always. I mean, the greatest millionaire, billionaires on the planet will tell you that, yeah, I mean, I was, I was rich for a while, and then I wasn't rich anymore. Things were really, really good. And then I got busted and I lost it all. I got thrown into jail because I cut some corners, did this or did that. or You know, things were going great. And then the stock market crashed and I lost everything. Or I lost 90% of it or whatever. It doesn't last. And you can't take it with you. So really... Wouldn't it be an easier life to try to work on being happy without that shit? Wouldn't it be easier for you to work on, like, okay, what do I got to do? What do I got to cut out of my life? So I can actually be happy without a billion dollars or a million dollars or even a hundred thousand dollars. What do I got to cut out of my life? Maybe I don't need this, you know, giant house with extra bedrooms or maybe I don't need this extra car. Maybe I don't need this and this and this, you know, do, do, do you, do you own your stuff or does your stuff own you? If your stuff owns you. I mean, you know, I was, I was 
I was watching a video the other day and they asked this like 90 something year old woman, I think she was 92 or 93 years old. And they were like, it was an actual interview. It wasn't staged. It wasn't, she, she wasn't an actor. They asked her, they said at 93 years old, what advice can you offer younger people? And the first thing out of her mouth, like it wasn't like love everybody or be kind or be gentle or, you know, it, it wasn't religious. It wasn't anything. She just said things. She's like, I spent so much time and energy and money accumulating stuff. And now that I'm getting ready to die, I'm going to be dead the next... I don't think I'm going to live to be 100. She's like, and I'm downsizing into a, you know, from a two-bedroom house to a one-bedroom condo. She's like, I'm trying to get rid of all this stuff that I'm accumulated, and people don't even want it. She's like, I can't even give it away. And she looks around the, her, her house, and it's like, this is what I worked my ass off to get all, is all this shit. And nobody even wants it. I don't even want it anymore. I don't even want it anymore. I'm sick of looking at this shit. Sick of looking at the furniture. Sick of looking at the knickknacks that I bought. All the, you know, designer plates and all the shit that women collect. Put around their house. Picture frames and whatever. I mean, probably pictures of their grandkids and their family... That's the priceless stuff, but the frames on them and, you know, the lamps and the couches and the chairs and the, you know, china and the fucking crystal glasses and the, you know, designer this and designer that and all this shit. She's like, it's all out of style now. She's like, I bought this stuff back in the 70s when it was cool to own this stuff. And now people will point at it and they, and they laugh at it. They're like, that, that stuff is junk. You couldn't even sell it for 50 cents at a garage sale. The shit, you, you know? You put it out there on the table in your driveway and say free and people won't even take it. She's like, I think of all the things that I could have done with this money besides spend it on myself. Just useless shit. Now, look, we all need a roof over our head, right? It's okay to spend money on that. We all need food and water and warmth and clothes. We just don't need 37 pairs of sweatpants and 10 pairs of shoes and 50 pairs of socks and, you know, 100 pairs of underwear. Like, we don't need all that excess stuff. We don't need all that extra stuff. She's like... You know, I could have helped so many people. Or I could have just lived more responsibly. You know? Store up all these treasures for yourself. And, you know, one day the the shelf falls off the wall and all the shit breaks. All, you know, fucking glass shards everywhere on shit that you spent hundreds of dollars on. Thousands of dollars on. It's like you, you, you worked your ass off at a high pressure demanding job so that you could get money to buy stuff. You know, and I, I don't want you guys to think that I'm like being like a minimalist, like, like you shouldn't have anything. Like, look, I have a, I have a guitar collection, you know. I mean, I'm, just as guilty, if not more guilty, than everybody else. I'm just really picking on myself more than anybody else. But it still... It still makes you think about all this shit, you know. The fact that some people can't even eat right now. Some, some people on this planet don't have enough money to buy food. They don't have enough money to pay for shelter. They're living under a bridge. Right? Meanwhile, I'm over here collecting Funko Pops. Like, what am I doing? It's, 
it's not my obligation to feed somebody, to clothe somebody, and to give somebody shelter. But it's like, I, I, I want, I want to do it. Like I, I wish, I wish my heart was just bigger than it is. I wish that I could, you know. Like I want to volunteer. I think people should volunteer to help. I don't think you should be forced to help, you know, like taxation and all that shit. But, you know, we don't live in an ideal world, so taxation happens and take again, take that, take the good with the bad. But I think the worst thing that taxation does, to be perfectly honest with you, the absolute worst thing it does is it makes you even more stingy than you would have been. Because the United Way calls you or somebody else can, oh, can you help feed my family? I don't know. And you go, dude, they already take taxes out of my paycheck for you fuckers. They already take taxes out of my paycheck. They already put a gun to my head and made me pay the government a certain amount, a certain percentage of my paycheck. So just figure out how to get some of that money. Like that, that tends to be your attitude. You know? Imagine if the government didn't tax any of your money. You got 100% of your money. Imagine that. I mean, everything would cost something, though. You know, every highway would be a toll road because somebody's got to pay for that shit. Every library, you'd have to pay money to check books out. And every, you know, stuff like that. So nothing would be for free. You know, you call the cops, you call the fire department. They send you a bill after they respond, right? Because there's no taxpayer money to pay for that shit. So it would be an interesting world without taxes. But, you know, when they have tax, tax money and they, they supposedly do things with it to help the unfortunates of the world, um, you just wonder, how can we still have homeless people if the tax revenue is in the trillions like, does that really make any sense? I think, yeah, we got to have a, we got to have in- infrastructure and we got to have a, mil- a, you know, a good military. Like, we got to have that. But you're telling me after we pay for all that shit that we need to have, we still don't have enough money left over to fucking feed homeless people and like build like shelters for them and stuff? Ugh. I'm not a socialist, I promise. I don't, I don't think that. You should be forced to do that, but I think you should want to do that because um, I've I've really take I've really got a different attitude toward um, people in need now than I used to have. Before I was like fuck them. I was like yeah they're a bunch of drug addict fucking losers. They're reaping what they sow. Whatever. They're too lazy to look for a job. You know. Whereas. Now I'm just like, I don't know their fucking story. How the hell am I supposed to know? Like, yeah, maybe that's true for a percentage of them, that they're lazy fuckers that don't want to look for a job and that they just want to live off of handouts. But I think there's a very large majority of people in the homeless community who have um, serious depression issues, uh, mental health issues in general, like, you know, schizophrenics walking the streets and shit. And then you have people that are just caught up in the world of drugs and they're just totally, you know, they, they, they can't get a job even if they wanted to because they, you know, they wouldn't pass a drug test. And, you know, because their parents were alcoholics and drug addicts and beat the shit out of them and they behave the way they behave now because they watched their parents do the same thing when, when they were kids, you know? Like you, you get caught up in this... Um, pattern, this uh, pattern of um, dysfunction, you know, for those of us who live in quote unquote normal society, you know, we, we, it's usually we, because we had semi-normal parents. Now, some of us will say, no, my parents were totally fucked up, but I escaped it. Well, good for you. I mean, that, that's great that you can do that. But it's, unfortunately, your story is the rare one. Your story is the, um, is the exception to the to the rule. The actual rule is, you know, you get raised in the ghetto, you stay in the ghetto. You get raised in the trailer park, you 
die in the trailer park. Most people don't get out. Most people don't get out. Most people get their girlfriend pregnant when they're 15 years old and, you know, got to get a job at the, at the Piggly Wiggly so you can pay for your son's, uh, um, you know, bottles and diapers and shit. Formula. It's like, man, your life's already over at 15. My life was just getting going at 15. I was just starting to learn guitar when I was 15 years old. You know, some of these low lowlifes, I mean, I hate to, hate to refer them to that, as that, but, I mean, that's kind of what they are, you know. Living in these ghettos and these trailer parks and shit, they, they just don't know any better. Like, the normal thing to do is just have sex with some girl unprotected, you know, as soon as you hit puberty. And of course, you know, if the shit gets too, too real, then then you just bail, right? You just you just go somewhere else. You you abandon your, the the mother of your child, and you abandon your child, and then the cycle just repeats itself all over again. Then that child grow, grow, grows up fatherless, surrounded by drugs in a in a trailer park, and he turns into a criminal by the time he's ten years old, and just keeps going. And then he knocks somebody up five years later when he's 15. You know, it just doesn't, it, it, it really wants to continue going in the direction that it's going in. It's got a lot of momentum in that direction. And like I said, some people escape, but it seems like the vast majority do not. So what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is those people need help. They don't need money necessarily. You don't throw money at them because then they go buy crack rocks with it. But they need mentors and guides. They need people to help guide them out of that shit. And at the very least, you know, give them food. At the very least. Especially the children. Most especially the children. The children who were born into the situation that didn't ask for it, didn't even do a damn thing to deserve it children oh that was a weird rant covered a little bit of ground there all right you guys have a wonderful night and a wonderful uh, rest of your weekend